Well, as uh, Donald has already mentioned, this is a very special day, a special Lord's Day. Uh, I hope not for the last time, but certainly for the first time, this congregation is going to appoint deacons. And uh, I wanted to offer a few thoughts about deacons and the work of deacons uh, as we uh, are gathered together today before we uh, engage in that important business. Uh, you know, deacons are a part of the plan of God. There's no question about that. Uh, and when you look at the Bible word, deacon, we just borrow the word from the Greek language, that uh, that word deacon is used, uh, I don't know, 30 times in the New Testament. Uh, and so oftentimes it's used in reference to uh, the work of, uh, of service in general. Uh, it's defined, in fact, as one who renders service to another, uh, an attendant, a servant, uh, one who executes a commission. That's what a deacon is. That's what the word itself means. It's the idea of somebody who's going to work. Uh, and uh, it is used uh, a number of times of just the work of Christians in general. We're called, all of us, in one sense, to be servants. Matthew 20, I'd like to, to take just a second to notice. In Matthew 20, in verse 20, this is the story uh, where we find that the mother of Zebedee's children came to Jesus with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said to her, what wilt thou? And she said, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? When he talks about the cup there, he's not talking about the Lord's Supper. Uh, he's talking about drinking or partaking, I think, of the cup of suffering. When he talks about baptism, I don't think he's talking about water baptism. He's talking about the baptism, the overwhelming of suffering that he would himself endure. Are you able to walk the road I walk? You ask for positions of greatness. But greatness is not just granted. Greatness is that which comes as a result of the choices that you make. Anyway, so... Uh, they say, oh, we're, we're, we're able. <laughs> Jesus said in verse 23, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And they would. All these men that were called uh, would, uh, would ultimately face great suffering. John, ironically, was the one that we know of that perhaps didn't die a violent death. But certainly they all endured great suffering. James was the first to be killed, in fact, of the apostles, not counting Judas. He was the first to be martyred for the cause. Oh, indeed you will drink of my cup and be baptized with my baptism. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. It is given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And first... 24 is interesting. He says that the, the, the Matthew notes that when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. I guess Matthew was one of them, wasn't he? Is Matthew later recalling how that, yeah, we were all mad when we heard the request. Mad we didn't think of it first. They weren't upset with the idea of being exalted. They just said, well, why do you guys get to be exalted? I'm better than you are. They'd had that conversation a lot of times before. It's a great example, isn't it, of how patient the Lord was? These were great men. They were great men because they had a heart to serve, but they had immaturity and they had a lot of, a lot of growing to do. So Jesus you know, takes charge of the matter. And he says to them in verse 25, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. 
We know what greatness is in the eyes of the world. But he said in verse 26, it shall not be so among you. That's not what greatness is about in the kingdom. Is how many people jump when you holler. Whomsoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And the word here is the word for deacon. It's the word diaconos. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came to be men, not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So here's a great lesson in, in the kingdom, and that is that greatness is not seen in pride, it's not seen in ego, it's not seen in, in being uh, fawned after, it's rather seen in serving and loving others. That's what being a deacon is about. And that's true in one sense for every one of us. And Christ is the example of that. He came as God who became man and he was spat upon and he was despised and he was nailed to a cross. And so with that spirit in mind of serving others at whatever it costs, we're all called to be deacons. But there are passages that refer to the work of deacons in a very special way. Uh, as an office, I think. Philippians chapter 1 comes to mind. In Philippians 1 and verse 1, beginning, Paul writes, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he calls on the, the church here and he addresses the saints. Well, that's everybody, isn't it? Anybody that's a Christian, not a saint, they are used synonymously. But then he calls on those who are bishops. Well, they're also saints, but they're more than that. They have a role, a work, of being an overseer, an episcopus. And in that same vein, he talks about the deacons. In one sense, every Christian is a servant. But here we find an office, a special work, just as surely as the elders are not just older Christians, but they have a special work. So here are deacons, special servants of the local church. And all this a part of God's plan. And guess what you know and I know, God never does uh, call for a work that's not needed. No congregation is fully organized as God would have it to be until there are men appointed elders and deacons. And every congregation that uh, is lacking that, and by the way, churches do have a right to exist before they have elders and deacons. I believe the Bible teaches that. But one thing I believe also is that such churches are lacking. And that the reason why people are appointed to these works is that, that the church might be uh, more fully capable of doing what God would have it to do. And so there are special servants that are appointed so that, that the work of God might have full, uh, full force. Another passage in which uh, we find the word deacon used in terms of an office is in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. And we've looked at this passage in recent days, but we'll read it again. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Let me pause to say he's describing here the character of the deacon, and uh, his life must reflect a certain character. He's a dignified individual. He's not a double-tongued individual. Not the kind of person who says one to one and something else the opposite to another. An honorable man. Uh, he is not addicted to much wine. As we've made the point before, that doesn't mean he has a little bit. It does not approve that uh, maybe a little bit of wine would be okay for him. In condemning what would be, in effect, drunkenness, which is, was a problem then and is a problem today, he does not justify less use of, of intoxicants any more than in the next phrase when he says not greedy of dishonest gain that he would be justifying or advocating being greedy of honest gain 
You know, here's a fellow, he says, to be a deacon, you must not be involved in a dishonest business and be greedy. Well, you can't be greedy as a Christian even if you've got an honest business. No, that the uh, condemnation of the extreme does not approve necessarily uh, anything short of that extreme. We think, I think as we read the passage, we understand exactly what he's talking about. Here are men of honorable character, men of sobriety, men who have the whole, rather in verse 9, the mystery of the faith in a pure or clear conscience. These are sincere, dedicated, honorable individuals. Let them also be tested first. And then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons be each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own house as well. Um, we maybe made the point in previous lessons. There are some who try to make verse 11 somehow uh, a special reference to deaconesses. <laughs> uh, but uh, that just really won't fit here for a number of reasons. Uh, the word is not deaconess. The word is wife. They're wives. In the context here, I believe this would apply to the deacon's wife as well as the elder's wife. Their wives must be likewise dignified, not slanderers, sober-minded, faithful in all things. Their family must likewise qualify in that way. They must be those who have children and they manage their children their own houses well. We understand that this is not calling on a man to be flawless. And I'll promise you something, the men that have been put forward, they have room to grow. Likewise, the elders have room to grow. And by the way, likewise, every other member have room to grow. The question is, uh, we're looking here for serious men, committed individuals, faithful individuals. And if we don't have such men, then you don't have men qualified. And if you do, what a blessing it is for them and for the church. For those who serve well as deacons gain good standing, verse 13, for themselves, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. They're specially qualified servants called to do the work of the Lord in a local church. Now, let me offer one other passage. Uh, these really are the two passages that use the term deacon as an office out of all the times it's used. But there's another passage that I think is relevant to our study. The word deacon is used, but not as a noun, as a verb. And it's that passage in Acts chapter 6. We've likewise read this in, in uh, days previous uh, together and not too long ago. But you remember the setting here. This is the old King James translation. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Wherefore, brethren... Look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed and laid their hands on them, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. It's a marvelous circumstance here, and I think there's some things we can learn from them. Now, people say, well, these were not deacons. They're not called deacons. Well, you do remember how the, the word deacon is used as a verb here. They were called to serve. Uh, and uh, whether they were deacons or not, they certainly were special servants selected by the church for special work. I think the parallel is there. What do we learn from these men? 
What lessons can we learn about deacons from this example? Well, one thing that's evident is that these men that were selected had a different work from that of the apostles. Elders are not mentioned in this passage. There were apostles in Jerusalem at that time. The work of an apostle is not the same as the work of an elder. But at any rate, just as the parallel might be found, the work of the apostles was the work of teaching, revealing to people the word of God. Uh, there were other things that needed to be done in the kingdom as well besides that work. There are plenty of jobs in the kingdom of God. What's the work of a deacon, somebody might ask? Well, I don't know of a passage that just goes through a list here, uh, uh, here 25 things that a deacon is called to do. Uh, I think we, we think about the church and we think about the fully organized churches having elders. What is the work of an elder? What, what work do they, are they called to do? They are the shepherds. They are to shepherd the flock. They are to feed the flock of God which is among them, taking the oversight thereof. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 5. So one way to look at the work of deacons is that, uh, that they're involved in all those other things that are not the elders' job. That, that is, the elders' work is, is, is specifically the idea of overseeing the whole, yes, but of feeding the flock of helping Christians to grow, of taking care of the flock, the sheep among uh, uh, that make up a local church. There are a lot of other things that uh, can be distracted in that regard. And so deacons are called upon to uh, oversee that work, to, to uh, head up that work, to uh, spearhead that kind of, of work. Uh, they concentrate on the things that will allow the elders to concentrate on what they're for, and I'm not trying to talk out of school, but Donald and I already, we've been on this job for a couple of months, and we have lamented the fact that we meet every week, at least once a week, uh, and they're just things that, uh, that, that still cry out to be done, uh, but there are other things that times can, uh, uh, can take up time. And one of the things we're looking forward to is having the help of, of godly qualified men uh, who will be able to, uh, to deal with a number of important things uh, that really are not primarily the work of, of the shepherd, though the shepherds are responsible for overseeing the whole. Uh, so these men were doing a different work than the work of the apostles. These men were also called to do important work because it's all important if it's the Lord's work, and that's right. Sometimes you'll hear people say things like this. They'll say, well, elders, they handle the spiritual things and deacons handle the physical things. Well, I, I think there's some truth in that. But uh, as we've said before, you look at the situation here in Acts chapter 6, um, you don't think that this idea of serving tables had an importance? In the first place, it's a part of the work of the church to take care of needy Christians. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16, if any man or woman have uh, widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve those that are widows indeed. Part of the work of the church, the, the use of the treasury involves the helping of needy saints. And that was the case here uh, in, uh, uh, in Jerusalem. There was a work involved here, the work of the Lord. And you can see how vital it was, I think, to the, to the future of this congregation. When you read these words in, in Acts chapter 1, or chapter 6 rather than verse 1, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. There's real trouble in the church. And if someone with wisdom and ability and a work ethic is not put in charge of this and deals with this, it's going to create more problems. The Hebrews and the Grecians are really two different families of the Jews. Some who had spent their time around Jerusalem and in Judea, some who came from other places. But uh, any difference can become a wedge if, if there's not wisdom and if there's not carefulness. So these fellows had an important work, and their success would be a vital part of the success of the work of the church as it went on. There's no menial work when it comes to the work of, of God. Uh, that passage in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42 is just a good general lesson where the Lord once taught us that whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly, he said, I say to you, he will be by no means, or he will by no means lose his reward. 
And that's right. There's plenty of work for people to do that are not deacons. There's work for everybody to do. But any work that's done by the deacons or others that is God's work is a work that has a dignity. And so these men were doing important work, though they were serving tables. Another thing that I think we learn is that these men certainly signed up for hard work. I don't know exactly how many folks they were serving. I know there were thousands of, of Christians there with the church at Jerusalem. And uh, so there were, I don't know how many. Apparently they thought seven men, that was the, the statement of the apostles, that seven men could cover it. But I'm sure of this, they were mighty busy in doing the work they had to do. And there were a lot of things involved in finding out who was a needy saint and in making sure their needs were taken care of. And where's the money, where's the, the food going to come from? And uh, handling the money and all those things that were involved in getting this job done. These fellows, I'm sure, were busy and they knew it would be difficult. I'll tell you something else uh, we can uh, learn from the context. They signed up for a work that would open them up to criticism. There had already been problems. And by the way, there were real problems there. Look back in, in verse 1 of chapter 6. He does not say that some people thought that there might have been a problem. He says there was a problem. That there were widows that were neglected. And this did bring criticism. And so these people are going to be under scrutiny. Will they be able to do this job better than it's been done before? When a man signs up for the work of a deacon, he signs up for work, he signs up for work that is dignified by being done for God's cause, but a work that will certainly always carry with it the, the possibility of criticism. Certainly that's true about shepherds as well. Sometimes it'll be justified. But an individual who signs up for this work can never be thin-skinned or above criticism that doesn't suit any Christian well, by the way, but it certainly will not do for those who serve as shepherds or those who serve as deacons. It's going to take tact. It's going to take patience to do the work that they're called on to do. These men also had responsibility over this matter. They were given a certain amount of freedom. That's exactly the language that, that Luke used here. Uh, we want you to seek out men whom we may appoint over this business. I don't think that uh, the work of deacons is intended to overshadow, overrule elders. That's not what it's about. But it, it seems a shame for men to be appointed as deacon and then micromanage to the point where they're almost unnecessary. You appoint men as deacons and you assign them work that they are able to do. And you give them the freedom to do that work. Uh, and that's what went on, I think, here in Acts chapter 6. They were called on to rise to the challenge. They were called on to manage means, to manage people, to be aware of circumstances, to be provident, to be able to see where we are and where we're going in that regard, to adjust to circumstances as they change. Men who are able to follow through if they're given a responsibility they're not the kind of people who just let that slide or fall through the cracks. They take every charge seriously, and to the best of their ability, they carry those things out. If people are able to make, admit mistakes, because that's all you can do with a mistake is admit it and correct it. They're people that love God and love God's work and love God's people. That's the kind of folks that these men were in Acts 6, and that's exactly what deacons are. Let me suggest to you further that these were men who were chosen in Acts 6 by the church, spiritual men. In Acts 6 and verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. It's not as extensive as the list uh, that we find for deacons in 1 Timothy 3, but I think the gist of it is, is, is uh, similar. They were men who were filled with God, selected by the church for this work. And I think it's fair to say that their work was a part of the success that we read about here. In the first place, when they were selected, the whole saying pleased the multitude. People were glad. And I'll say this about our circumstance. I think people are glad 
at the prospects of having deacons. And I think they're going to be more glad when they see deacons working and uh, being able to accomplish things. But uh, verse 7 tells us that the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. I think if they were still struggling with the problem that we found in verse 1, verse 7 would not have been true. So all of this works together. Everybody doing their part, whether it be the shepherds or the deacons or any one of us, in order to make the work go forward as it should. So um, I'm going to at this time ask certain men to come forward and to, to stand here before the congregation. Uh, Chris Brakefield, uh, Justin Hold. Darren Odom and uh, Jeff Swindle. We're a couple of fellas short today. Marcus McSpadden and Chris Bradley, likewise, are of this number. Uh, and I regret so much that they're not able to be here, but they're with us in spirit. And they're certainly included in what's going on and what we're doing today. These men have been chosen by the church to serve as deacons for the North Bibb Church. They have been proven by the brethren here and today they are appointed to serve as deacons of this congregation with the wholehearted approval of the elders. This is a great credit to God, to the grace of God to these men, to their character, to their families, their wives. And we rejoice so much in this day and in this time. They have agreed to take on this work and we're thankful to them for that. It is a work that holds great responsibility. It is a work that holds great accountability. It is a work that holds likewise the promise of great reward. We're glad for their willingness and we're glad for their service. And we ought to let them all know as members here how much we do appreciate their sacrifices and the choice that they've made to take this position. I'm gonna ask Donald to come forward and lead us in a word of prayer on behalf of these men. And then I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to then dismiss these men after that back to their seats and Donald will conclude by offering the uh, invitation. Let us pray. Kind Heavenly Father, we humbly approach thy throne of grace at this time. We give thee thanks for all the many blessings that you so richly bestow upon us. We give thee thanks, Heavenly Father, for thy mercy and thy grace and thy love toward us. You are, you are uh, uh, so kind and so loving, Heavenly Father, and we pray that we might be ever mindful of this. Heavenly Father, we... Uh, Give thee thanks for these men who, uh, who have been put forth as, to, to serve as deacons. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you might bless these men with wisdom and courage, that you might help them to, to work diligently in the, the opportunities that have been set before them, Heavenly Father, to, to take on the role as, as a deacon and that they may serve well. We pray that they may serve in such a way that they are, they are truly pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to work with these men, to encourage them, and to give them the honor and the, the, uh, 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 all that we can to, to, to help them along in, in, as, the, as they serve in this role as, as a deacon. Help us, Heavenly Father, to, to uh, 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 give them the, uh, uh, all, all the support that they need that they, may, that they may serve thee faithfully, Heavenly Father, that they may build us up as a congregation of thy people. 
Please be with this, these men. Please help them. Please strengthen them. Please, please uh, bless them with wisdom and courage, Heavenly Father. Please uh, help them to serve faithfully. Help, help us all, Heavenly Father, to, to be pleasing in thy sight. Again, we give thee thanks for all that you've done, and we give thee thanks for these men. In the name of thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Be seated, I'll mention one thing quickly before I turn it over to Donald, and he'll extend an invitation. Just hang in there, Don. I'm just going to be a second. Uh, we would like to meet with the, uh, the deacons for just a moment after the service in the intermediate room. I think they're going to be counting uh, the, the treasury and handling that in the regular room there. It's going to be a brief meeting, and I realize today is a, um, a special day in many ways. But uh, we just want to uh, uh, pass out some thoughts about deacon assignments and ask you to look at some things and pray about it. So we're going to have a brief meeting at the intermediate room here immediately after the service for those men. Thank you so much. <clears throat> We never want to go through a, a service without offering a, an invitation to those who, uh, uh, who are in need to, to obey the gospel. And we offer that invitation now. And if, there, if you know, uh, uh, there may be those who are ready, who, who know their need, and uh, that, that have not obeyed the gospel. And there may be those who, there, there may be something that stands between you and God, those who have obeyed the gospel. But... Uh, there is a, a distance between you and God. Whatever the need is, we plead with you to come now as we stand and sing. <clears throat> <clears throat> 